Calling all Arizona attorneys. Where are my brothers and sisters at? I hope you are ready to be educated and inspired. Or at least entertained. Because it is time for Cluff's Notes on Arizona Lawyer Life. I'm your host, Arizona attorney, Brig Clough. My guest today is Scott Palumbo. Scott is the current president of the Arizona Association for Justice, formerly known as the Arizona Trial Lawyers Association. It is a tremendous organization, and I have been a longtime member of it myself. Scott is a founding partner of the law firm of Palumbo, Wolf, and Palumbo. He is a proud husband and the father of two great kids. Like me, Scott's practice is focused on representing plaintiffs in personal injury and wrongful death cases. He has a passion for protecting the rights of injured people and their families. I am joined here by Scott Palumbo. We go back to law school, don't we, Scott? 1998. Graduated 2001, ASU Law School. That's right. Probably the most accomplished class ever from the Arizona State University College of Law, wouldn't you say? Okay. Especially if you ask certain of our friends. That's right. Uh, I mean, we've got you. <laughs> right, whatever. We've got, uh, well, we've got, we've got a member of the Supreme Court, don't we? Yes, we do. And before that. Pretty incredible. Yeah. County attorney. Uh, are you in touch with uh, Bill Montgomery very much? No, I am not. Uh, one of our friends is. I know he's had uh, some conversations with him. I have not. Yeah, I've, I'm not as close with him as our, our mutual friend, but I, I've stayed in touch with him. And I'm, uh, I'm a fan. I, I, I got to say, I mean, uh, whether he shares my politics or not, I, I think he's done a pretty good job. I totally agree. Okay, so Scott, first of all, I want to just kind of paint a little biographical picture of your life because you, you've had an interesting life. You're the only person I know that is a second-generation Notre Dame punter. Is that right? Uh, second, no, not second generation. I thought you were second generation. Well, no, my dad went to Notre Dame. He oh. did not play football there. He went to law school there. Oh. Yeah, no, no, no. My, my, Dang. My dad couldn't punt a football that far. Well, I have this memory of you telling me, but it could just be a figment of my imagination, but it it's definitely seems real. But I have this memory of you telling me, my dad was a punter, I'm a punter, and my kids will be punters. Wow. Um. I don't think I said that. I hope I didn't. Um, okay. You, know, uh, I, you didn't hang out that late at night with some of us in, in, in law school, so uh, yeah, where I may have said something like that, but I don't think I did. Dang. Well, folks, that's an object lesson for you. <laughs> you just can't trust memory. You got to do your research, Rick. Come um, on. Scott, not only do I have that memory, I have told that to a <laughs> dozen people at least. Like, oh, yeah, I've got a friend from law school. He was a Notre Dame punter, and so was his dad. And he says that his children will also punt for Notre Dame. Well, the, the last part is true. Is like, you know, I mean, not too many people know how to punt a football, so I do have that knowledge to pass on to my children, and I hope my son uh, and even my daughter are athletic enough to try. Okay. But I can tell you, if you've ever watched my dad try to, try to kick a football, um, he did not do that at the collegiate level. All right. My wife, actually was the athlete in the family. She she ran track and cross country at Notre Dame. Really? And uh, finished third in the Big East. She l ran long distances. Wow, that is awesome. Um, was she there at Notre Dame at the same time as you? Yeah, so the story, it's, it's a good story. I end up, uh, so I was class of 96. I stayed for a fifth year class of 97. There was a girl um, in my class named Heather Dodds. Uh, two of my roommates uh, pined over Heather. Uh, throughout college. So I knew Heather had a younger sister who was a year behind her named Emily Dots. Uh, Emily, I had seen the girls track team running around during practice. And, you know, I, I knew that Heather's uh, sister, Emily, was, was one of those people. 
I never, never hung out, talked to Emily. But um, about six years later, one of my Notre Dame teammates got married uh, in Detroit to uh, one of my now wife's uh, Notre Dame friends. And the two of us sat at the singles table together. And uh, I saw that as my inn. I well, said, it's yeah. destiny, obviously. I, I, said, I said, you know, we're at the singles table. Uh, aren't you Heather's younger sister? Uh, we have spoken every day since and uh, now have two kids together. All right. Well done. So that's uh, that's uh, so I didn't know her at the time, but uh, that did provide the ability for us to meet each other. Very cool. Where's she from? Connecticut. Okay. Uh, her family still lives there. She lived in Manhattan for uh, the time we met, so it was my second or third year being a lawyer, so every other weekend one of us would fly back and forth from Manhattan um, and trying to be a young lawyer and get your work done, flying the uh, late night flights back and forth from Manhattan. Got a little old, so uh, finally she moved out here. I haven't spent a lot of time in New York. In fact, I've only been there one time. Once? And just once, wow. yeah. And I, I really love it. I mean, I am enchanted by New York City. I loved my time there. Whether I could actually live in the city uh, is different, but going back and seeing it, the, the you just feel, you, you, you feel energetic just by walking around on the streets. Yeah, you really do. I mean, I like the fact that you don't have to drive a car. Yeah. You get whatever you want on any block you want. I, I love how friendly the people are. I, I, honestly, I'm from an Italian family from New Jersey, so it doesn't bother me. I actually like how real people are, you know? They'll tell you how they feel. I, I missed my moment there, uh, Scott. I, when, I, when I said that hilarious line, I meant to do this. <laughs> sound effects. Yeah, sound Press. effects. And we are <laughs> at the next level. Uh, you're from an Italian family? Well, uh, my, my, my father's side, all Italian. My, a little bit of Irish there. My mother's side, Slovak. But uh, it, it's funny, my... my, my uh, my dad is 100% Palumbo. My grandmother's maiden name was Palumbo. Uh, uh, that may be why I have that little tick. Yeah, uh, I've, I've often that, wondered uh, what's going on there. No. They, 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 there's the no. different, different Palumbos, but okay. that's what they say. So maybe <laughs> if, I, if there's anything wrong with me, maybe that has something to say about it. Um, you know, my wife is a good athlete too. Not a collegiate level athlete, but a better than me athlete. And I'm an okay athlete. I mean, I'm not, like, particularly great at anything, but I'm an okay athlete. My wife's a good athlete, and I've got four daughters. One of my daughters is a good athlete, and my son is a good athlete. So I'm, I'm happy, I, and it's really important to my son. He's, he's into it. Volleyball is his sport that he's playing right now, and he's a good leaper, and it's a great sport. Right. Okay, so Scott... We, um, we went to law school together, and um, we both knew that our dads were personal injury attorneys, right? Yes. Good ones. Yeah, good ones. And I, you know, I wasn't sure that that's what I was going to do, but I, I thought that there was a, a very good chance that that's what I would end up doing. Uh, how about you? Were you planning on it? No, not at all. Um, I actually grew up watching my dad Personally, I, I thought work too hard. He would, this is before internet, before you could really work effectively remotely. He would get up and be out of the house before I woke up. Uh, he never, he would work until I had whatever sports event or whatever event. He never missed an event. And then he would come home and he would eat with the family. And then he'd get back in his car, drive all the way back down to the office and work until 10, 11 o'clock at night. And then he'd come home. And during trials, you know, I mean, you could just see the, the stress. And I, I didn't like it. I, 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 I said, that's, that's, I don't think that's for me like growing up. And then, you know, I go to, law, I go to undergrad and, you know, I, I, my four years are up. Uh, I delayed my degree to come back for a fifth year um, under the auspices of play football and also study for the LSATs. Well, because I didn't know what else I wanted to do. Nothing else intrigued me. 
So I thought I was going to go with the FBI. And I worked for Senator McCain my, my, my senior year, going into my senior year at, at Notre Dame as an intern. And the people who worked around there, you know, gave me more insight in the FBI. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, I decided I didn't want to do that. So when I, I come back to my fifth year for Notre Dame, I didn't study for the LSAT. So I went and bartended in Chicago for a year. And at that time, I took the LSAT. Wasn't really prepared for it, but uh, I did okay. And uh, went to law school, not knowing if I wanted to do that. I knew that if you got a law degree, you can do whatever you wanted. Well, I ended up getting a job at uh, Jennings Strauss and Salmon. Uh, my dad told me, listen, if you go to law school, you will not get a job from me. I will not hire you. You need to go succeed by yourself. And if you decide at some point in time this is what you want to do, then we can have that discussion. But by the time that that occurred, my dad was no longer running his firm, making the employment decisions. So when I, when, when I went to Jennings, Strauss, and Salmon, I had unbelievable opportunities to get into court right away because this is when Phoenix was expanding and um, SRP was putting in power lines all throughout the valley. And they had a huge condemnation team getting mm. the land rights to put the power lines in. And Doug Zimmerman and the people at, 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 at Jennings Strauss chose me for whatever reason to help them out. Handsomeness. It, well, yeah. It was mostly yeah. handsomeness. Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm sure. So they, they and, and next thing you know, I'm in court uh, doing all these hearings. Uh, and I loved it. I thought this was what I'm going to be doing. And, you know, so I helped out on the condemnation team. And then one day, the managing partner came up to me at Jennings Strauss and said, hey, uh, we, there's a gentleman here, Robert Tolman. He runs the plaintiff practice. Uh, would you like to help him? And, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm of the mindset that I, if you ask me to go do bankruptcy, I don't, I don't know how to do it, but I'll say yes to anything. So I said, sure, but you know what my dad does. So I had never thought of doing plaintiff's work. It wasn't my intention. I go work with Robert and we do very well, and I like it. And a, about a year later, my dad's firm was looking to hire an associate, and the fit was there. And ever since then, I've done nothing but practice plain personal injury law. But no, it wasn't, hey, you know, Scott, this is your future. It played out that way, and I'm darn glad it played out that way, but it was never my life goal, my intention to do this. Wow. I didn't know that you had that connection to Robert Tolman. I didn't know that he was at Jennings, Strauss, and Salmon back in the day. He, uh, besides my father, you know, watching my father, Robert was one of the first mentors I had uh, and really g gave me the first insight on what it takes to do this job and do it well. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, I, I, I always uh, have dear love and respect for him. Well, uh, Robert is one of my dad's best friends. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're tight. Um, and I, I know Robert through my dad. I, I don't know him as well as you know him probably, but I, uh, I'm an admirer just like you are. He's a darn good lawyer. Yeah, absolutely. And Chris Bodie over there also helped me out. And the good thing about working at a big firm like that, as opposed to what we do now where we have our own shops, you, you, you actually see and you hear from both sides of the fence because those firms do a lot of defense work too. They do a lot of other type of law. So you actually get the, the broader picture rather than just, you know, you know the, the, the plaintiff-only uh, viewpoint. So I, 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 a lot of people ask, what should I do if I want to be a personal injury lawyer? And you'll, you can always end up there, but it, it's good to go get those experiences yeah. and see how other people do things, see how other people think, see how other things are handled. Because uh, that time, it was only two years that I was there, but gave me a heck of a foundation to be able to do what I'm doing now. Yeah, so your your experience was uh, different than mine. It, it sounds like you, right out of law school, you know, in those first two years, felt like you were doing good things and thriving. And um, I, I felt not just for two years, but probably for more like 10 years, like I did not know what I was doing in the practice of law. I mean, it took a long time before I felt like I've got this. 
please don't please don't uh, mistake the fact that I was enjoying I was I was excited as having confidence that I was doing it right. I'm a firm believer of you know jump into the fire, do things you're uncomfortable with. Um, so I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I I but I was excited doing it. And so I knew at that point, even though I was just pretty much went to law school because I didn't know what else I wanted to do, I knew at that point I made the right decision to become a lawyer. Um, yeah. Well, that's really awesome. I um, Condemnation law is actually something, strangely, um, I mean, doesn't seem like the sort of thing that most uh, law students would uh, focus on, but... In law school, I thought, wow, that would be really cool to do these condemnation cases. Well, especially in a town like Phoenix. Yeah. That, that ex, ex, is expanding, is yeah. changing, uh, is growing. Um, it, it, and especially around the 2000 time period, the economic expansion, there was so much going on that you just got opportunities because there was so much demand. And I just found myself at that spot, and they gave me the opportunity. Um, but you also learn with opportunity comes responsibility. So it makes you take it a little more seriously that you're not in law school anymore, that you are standing in front of real judges who can enter real sanctions and helps you grow up quicker. Well, that's for sure. Um, which I needed. (laughs) Um, Didn't we all? So when I finished law school, I didn't go to work for my father's firm either. I, I went to Bonnet, Fairborn, yeah, Friedman, yeah, and Belint. Yeah. And I was there for a while. It's a good firm. It was a good firm then, and it's a good firm now. And they really provided for me what I was looking for at the time, which was, strangely enough, I mean, it seems strange to me now because I, I really don't have much interest in this now. But um, at the time, I wanted to do real estate transactions. Really? Yeah, can you believe that? Oh God, I mean, I, you know, I have, we have a lot of friends who do that, and I'm just I, I knew from day one I'm not a transactional guy. Yeah, I, I couldn't be. Well, uh, you knew yourself better than I knew myself then, uh, because and and it's actually not that I was so interested in real estate transactions. Well, uh, no, I, I should say it's not that I was so interested in doing real real estate transactional work. It's that I wanted to be a billionaire. Well, and I thought, oh, I'll learn. I'll be a deals guy, and I'll just make all these deals, and pretty soon I'll be a billionaire. That was my plan. Well, if, if, I, if I could go back and know the certain deals that a lot of my friends have been involved in, and, and I'd, I'd be their transactional lawyer any day of the week. <laughs> but um, that's just not the way it, it, it panned out. So, you know, and the other thing is, at Jennings Strauss, my, my uncle, my dad's twin brother, is also a very, very good lawyer. Um, and he just doesn't do personal injury law. He does more of the commercial litigation stuff. So, you know, another reason that I didn't know what I wanted to do, I know my dad's twin brother was very successful doing what he was doing. Um, and I didn't know, do you, do you go into practice with your family directly? You know, you've heard horror stories about how that doesn't work out well. Sure. Um, you know, it, it, it's so... So going to a place like Jennings Strauss, I did work with my uncle there, and he was a great mentor to me. You know, it wasn't a one-on-one, you know, we had our own law firm. So maybe that helped Helped um, also let me know that working with a family member can work. And then going to uh, the Harris Palumbo Powers in Cunningham, uh, was the result of that. I don't know how it played out, but that's where I, I went. In 2003, and um, you know that they have done plaintiff's work ever since. Wow, that's very cool. So I didn't know that your dad had a twin brother. Uh, what, what's your uncle's name? Uh, Uncle Mike, Michael Un- Palumbo. And, and is he still in practice? Yeah, he's of counsel at Jennings Strauss now. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, doing real well. So um, one of the things that I um, that I remember it, it seemed like it was very early in my career, but it, it probably wasn't as early as we've already demonstrated. My memory is uh, not perfect here, uh, but I, I remember this as being fairly early in my career, but maybe it wasn't 
as early as, as I think. And I don't think you and I had been in touch for a long time um, since law school, but I had remained in touch with Mike McGee, who's our mutual friend. Great. Um, and I remember I was out on a camp out with the, um, the Boy Scouts because uh, that was a church calling. I was asked to go help out with the Boy Scout camp, and so I was, that's what I was doing. And uh, I got a text from Mike McGee. I hadn't, hadn't actually heard from Mike in a little while either, but, um, and he says, Scott Palumbo just got, and I can't remember the amount, but I remember it was a multi-million dollar verdict. It was $7 million. Dang! That was in 2006 or seven. This calls for a sound effect. Yes, thank you. All right, so you're well, you're in practice five, well, six years? Five years at that time. And you get a $7 million verdict. Yeah, so that all goes back to um, Jennings Strauss and um, not knowing any better, okay? So I, when I was at Jennings Strauss, I was helping Robert Tolman in the plaintiff's practice. One of the secretaries at uh, Jennings Strauss's daughter was dating a gentleman. They were engaged. Um, they did not yet, they weren't married. They, they were, had every intention to be married. Uh, he got in a horrible motorcycle crash. Uh, or a girl had pulled out from a private drive onto 7th Street uh, in front of his motorcycle. He was catastrophically injured um, to the point where he could not take care of his own affairs. The fiancé, under the law, has no, no, no control over his decision-making, but nobody else in his life could do that. So the secretary introduces me to her daughter, and I don't know what to do in this circumstance, and Robert says, you, you need to set up a, 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 a guardianship, an emergency guardianship. I've never done that. Well, I figured it out. And um, Kim, the fiance, and I had a good bond. Well, um, part of the case resolved. I moved on because that's, that, that's when I left to go to um, Harris Palumbo Powers at Cunningham. At that point in time, I'm, I'm practicing there for a few months. I can't remember the time period. But they said, hey, Scott, uh, I get a phone call from uh, the lawyer at, at, at Jennings Strauss who had continued to handle the claim after Robert and I had left the firm. And he said, we have a conflict. There's... Um, you know, we can't continue to handle whatever portion of the case is left. Okay. Would you, Kim remembers you from helping out with this conservatorship. Will you consider taking care of the rest of the case? I think there, there may be a hundred thousand dollar policy remaining or something, something small. Wow. Well, at that point in time, I'm young, dumb, stupid. I don't know. Of course I'll help Kim. Well, I get the, I get the claim. And I say, uh, there's, there's, this girl was driving her car at the direction of her soccer coach. And Ooh. she's in the course and scope of her soccer club training session because her coach had told this 16-year-old who only had her license for a very short period of time, let's meet in Mesa. At this meeting point. And then he asked her, hey, I want you to drive four other children and follow me up to North Mountain Park in Phoenix, 20 some miles away. We're going to run up the mountain and then we're going to go back to this meeting point and then you can disperse. And I'm I'm thinking back to law school. Hey, during the time she's transporting these children on behalf of the soccer club. She's in the course and scope of the soccer club. The soccer club must be responsible. They must have a liability policy, right? Mm -hmm. So I start pursuing that aspect. And next thing you know, it's not a $100,000 claim anymore. We're talking about many, many, many million. Okay, let me stop you because I, I want to know, how did, you, how did you get this information about her, this errand that she was on? Were you in litigation at, at some point? In this or 
No. I think I, do, I can't, you know, it's been it's been 14 years now, so I can't really remember okay. where I knew about this. And I think it was from, you know, the lawyer at Jennings Strauss who was still handling it may have may have triggered me on to this idea and I just ran with it. But um, it was an absolute fight about whether or not this is uh, a course and scope, a respondeat superior issue. Um, it went up through the entire litigation, motions to dismiss. Um, you had to have a special interrogatory at the uh, uh, for, for the jury trial. Ooh, I would love to know. I mean, I wouldn't expect you to remember the exact language, but well, uh, I mean, how that sort of question gets phrased to the jury, I think, is so critical. Very, very simple, um, because uh, it's it. And, and here's the thing: is we went to we went through multiple rounds of mediation. Where at one point in time. Uh, thought we had this case settled, and it didn't settle. Uh, the insurance company, um, or for whatever reason, we thought we were done with this case, but it didn't get resolved. Uh, we went to trial, and there were the jury awarded many millions above where we thought we had the case resolved for. Uh, when the jury comes back and they say, we, the jury, find in favor of it's every trial lawyer's butt pucker moment, they can say, the plaintiff or the defendant. And those are the two words you, you listen to at that moment. Because if mm-hmm. they say the defendant, case over, done, you're out. You get nothing. But if they say, we, the jury, find in favor of the plaintiff, okay, I just jumped that hurdle. This is a case where we had... Um, uh, you know, life care plans over fifteen million dollars. The defense life care plan was many millions of dollars. Okay, but it's it's whether or not you get that because there was contributory fault there. Is my guy, uh, my client, the motorcycle rider responsible for causing this crash? So, so there's so we the jury find in favor of the plaintiff. So okay, I'm holding one hurdle I'm, cleared. I'm, two I'm, more to go. I'm holding Kim's hand and. I probably crushed her hand um, because, by the way, the fiance, even to this day, has stayed with my client, and she has taken incredible care of my client. My client is doing wonderfully. So with that in mind, this is back before we knew whether there'd be anything to help take care of him, Wow. let alone whether she was going to stay with him. So this is one of the best stories I have in my legal careers because this has turned out wonderfully. Well, the jury, we find in favor of the plaintiff. In the amount of, and then second butt pucker moment, $7 million. Okay, we got that. Next So is, far, so good. We find the relative degrees of fault to be. And there is... Um, a line for my client, the motorcycle driver, the, uh, the 16-year-old girl, and the soccer club, okay? Because there's an independent claim of the supervision for the soccer mm, club. Interesting, okay. Okay? So then you're like, oh, God, what are they going to say? Because if they say, you can have $7 million verdict, and if they put 100% fault or 99% fault on your, your client, you get 1% of $7 million. Okay, so. Okay, wait. Before you reveal yes. this next part, I want to ask you you've got a, um, an independent liability claim against the soccer club for negligent supervision. Well, it, but, it, it, but you also have a respondeat superior yeah. theory that, it, that, it, that if they answer the interrogatory in the right way, Anything that gets attributed to the 16-year-old will pass through up to the soccer club, right? That's why the case was tried. Okay. Because they didn't think that there would be agency there. They didn't think that that pass-through would happen. Okay. But they, if I look back, the actual claim against the soccer club was on behalf of the coach who they did acknowledge was an agent. So there was an independent claim against the coach for um, his actions. Got it. Okay. So the coach, the player, and my client, the motorcycle driver. We find the relative degrees of fault to be uh, my client, 
17%, I believe it was. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. You'll take that. In any motorcycle case, yes. Um, this was clear that I don't think anybody in any vehicle could have avoided this, but anytime you have a motorcycle rider, you have a bias probably against the motorcycle rider. Some people do. So I'm taking 17% any, any, any day. Okay, so at this point, Kim's hand probably is about, you know, ready to either lose blood supply or break because I'm squeezing so hard. Uh, we find the coach to be, and I think it was 1% or 2%. Oh. So now we have the player. Okay, let's do the math. I think that leaves 81% to her. So now... I have 83% of $7 million going to the defendants. but All writing on how they answer the interrogatory. Yes. So now, I mean, we've, we've, we've got to all of these hurdles, and the special interrogatory is, do you find player to be an agent of the soccer club? Yes or no? So after they announce this, we find relative degrees of fault to be 17, 2, and uh, 81. Do the, the clerk reads, do you find player to be an agent of the soccer club? Yes. Boom. At that point, um, that's when you know you've, you've accomplished the, the goal of getting your client the just compensation they deserve. Um, Oh, you've changed his life. Oh, you, oh, you've changed many lives forever through that result. Oh, and and that really was at the first. And my my partner, my my true one of my you know my dad and Elliot Wolf, who we had just started earlier that year, the law firm that I'm at now, Palumbo Wolf and Palumbo. So, being a five year lawyer, having the opportunity to put my name on the door with two legends, my dad and Elliot Wolf, that I probably didn't deserve, but I wasn't going to take it for granted. Having that result that I brought into the firm my first year of being in a law firm with these guys helped give me the confidence that, hey, I've contributed and it helped provide a foundation that I know I can go now and do these things. I watched how Elliot tried that case and, you know, how we worked it up and that that to me just caused some confidence the ability to think big and like Mike said I was just happened to be the lucky one who found myself in that position because I helped a girl whose uh, fiance needed help she remembered me you treat people right today you don't know when it's going to come back to help uh, you in the future but if you treat people right things will work out well I learned that lesson and um, I was one of the lucky ones when you're five years out and the word goes around quickly. Holy crap. Yeah, it made its Pal way up to Flagstaff in no time. Yeah, Palumbo gets, Palumbo gets a $7 million verdict. Well, guess, guess what all of our friends know? I'm now a personal injury lawyer. Guess where all those referrals go? Not to me. Well, you know, now they are. <laughs> now they are. But I just happened to be the first one out of the gate. Right, right. You know, and... So that, believe me, that has, if it weren't for that, that, that result, um, maybe I would have gotten to where I am now today, but it sure as heck helped because that was 14 years ago and, and it's been a great ride since. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And, and you have, you have gone on to do great things. And I, I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier when we were discussing, but you are currently the, the president of the Arizona Association for Justice, formerly known as the Arizona Trial, Trial Lawyers Association presidency has been extended by this pandemic. Uh, oh, as, is that right? Yeah. John Osteen is the president-elect right now. And as I reminded him in a meeting we had yesterday uh, on a contentious issue that the president has to take uh, charge of, I was really wishing he would uh, have been taking his position in May. But since we can't get our, our, our membership together to do the election. I'm now in my 13th month of now, being you don't, president. You don't want John uh, at the reins in a, an important time like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's going to make me look bad for what I, what I should have done. So. Uh, no, I'm, yeah, just, no, I, I'm just kidding about the, that. The, 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 being the president of the trial lawyers has been, it's been a privilege because I, I grew up at the time like you did, where 
uh, my dad was actually the president elect at one time. And I forget what tort reform battle it was, but he was president elect the, the year that um, they really went after tort reform and went after this business. I still remember that an election night watching the television for the election results about whether or not they were going to change the Constitution to allow tort reform in Arizona. And it took so much out of my dad and the people in the trial lawyers back then, trial lawyers association back then, that he actually resigned his presidency and never served as president of the organization because he just he put, put so much time in as president-elect. So it was actually it was it was an honor to be able to say I was the first Palumbo to be the uh, trial lawyer's president because as having my dad do what he did, it's, it's hard to be the first Palumbo to accomplish anything legally in well, Arizona with, with my dad and my uncle. That's, that's probably true, but uh, I, I've just learned that you actually were the first Palumbo punter at Notre Dame, <laughs> so there's that too. Yeah. Um, and your dad uh, is, was a beloved figure you know, among the, the trial lawyers bo- uh, bar. I mean, everybody loved him. I, um, not everybody. Well, there are defense lawyers out there too. Okay, sure. Not everybody. <laughs> kidding. If everybody loves you, you're probably doing something wrong, but he was beloved and, um, I didn't know him well, but I, I went and watched you try a case once. And, um, I was chatting with your dad at, at some point in an intermission, uh, maybe after you had just given your closing argument. And I, I said to him, man, you, you know, Anthony, your, uh, your son did a great job there. And there were tears in his eyes. He could not speak. He was filled with pride. You know, eventually he did speak, and he said yes. And he, he, was, he was beloved, and, and, he, and he loved you and was very proud of you. And it, it's great to see you uh, leading the organization right now. Thank you. No, it's, uh, as you know, um, it takes years to build a reputation. You can ruin it in a second. So especially when you have a father's reputation, you feel like you also have to uphold. It's a, it's a, it's a tremendous responsibility, but a privilege. So, yeah. Okay. So Scott, let's, uh, let's ruin that reputation now <laughs> with uh, a few questions that I want to ask you. Yeah. So right now, uh, it's an interesting time. It, it feels like we're starting to get back to normal. You know, it's, it's the beginning of June and we've been in about, I guess it's been a pandemic for, what, about three and a half months now? Yeah. But people are coming back to the office now. I, I've been working at the office this week, and, and we're meeting here face-to-face. This is something that wasn't happening uh, not very long ago. Um, and we're getting back into the way things were, it seems like, who knows uh, what the future holds, but that's just the way it seems. And with that comes the bullshit, right? Yep. So some of the bullshit that you haven't been dealing with as much for the last three and a half months is uh, probably accrued, and you get to deal with it now. So, you know, this podcast, it's geared towards lawyers. And what I want to do is talk about how you deal with the bullshit, and it can come in a lot of different ways. Probably the, the first thing that lawyers think of is opposing counsel. But it can come from judges and clients and family who doesn't really know what you're doing. Uh, it can come from free advice seekers. So talk to me. How do you deal with it? Sometimes better than others is, is, is the bottom line. This, this past few months... I think everybody's had a lot of time for self-reflection. Um, so the stress, I'm not saying this time hasn't been stressful because I personally needed the break from the daily grind, the daily bullshit, the fights, the, you know, that little feeling in your chest you get when you walk in the office every day because you know you're just going to, you're going to go in and you're going to deal with, you're dealing with problems. You're trying to make bad things right. The other side's trying to do the same thing. You're talking about a lot of money. You're talking about a lot of personal issues. You're talking about being sued. You're talking about suing somebody. It's not an easy job what we do. So going in every day, uh, people who say, you know, just, you know, treat it like a job. No, it can't. It's a passion. It's a, it's, 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 it's a calling. 
okay? If you just treat it like a job, get out of it because you're not doing the job properly because you're representing people in their time and need. So the past few months, the, 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 that, that feeling of I have to go fight this fight today on behalf of my clients and represent them and do the best I can hasn't been there in the traditional sense of I'm sitting at my desk. There's been a replacement of stress in that is there going to be a is there going to be civil trials anymore? Are we going to get a jury anymore? Oh my god, I can't do I I can't sit at my office and send a letter and expect that they're going to respond. So um, do we just put things on hold for a while? If we put things on hold for a while, well then are we are we going are we backed up into next year? Um you know, so this, there are different stresses that we've been having, but the daily grind of, of having any type of interaction or disagreements with the other side has been a nice break. I think that both sides of the fence are now coming back, and I don't know how it's going to be. Uh, are we going to sit around, continue to do things as usual? Are we going to have in-person depositions? Are we going to have trials set anytime soon? I still think it's too, too soon to know how things are going to play out. But back to the issue of stress, um, there are stresses. It's just different stresses at this time. How you deal with them is how I've been doing it during this time is to Treat it like, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I have no control. And once you realize you have no control, you start living in the moment a little better. You stop taking things for granted like, hey, you know what? I'm going to use this opportunity to go out and throw a baseball with my son. So I've actually really enjoyed this time. And if it weren't for the financial uncertainty and the career uncertainty and the, you know, what's going to happen in this world uncertainty... This has been a good few months, personally. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm I'm aware that it has not been that for a lot of people. A lot of people are in really terrible circumstances where they've lost their job, they can't pay bills, people around them are sick or dying. Fortunately for me and for you, I haven't had that. And I, my experience, my personal experience, even though I'm aware of the, that there's a lot of suffering out there, has been similar to yours. In fact, I, I almost feel like I have spent three and a half months at the cabin. You know, we, I've got all of my family in close together. We're all quarantining together or have been quarantining together. And it's been an opportunity for a lot of family closeness. Uh, my two oldest daughters just got married and, um, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. I saw pictures. You didn't look, they didn't look proud at all. No, no, (laughs) hardly at all. Uh, my, um, so my, my new family members, these two new sons-in-law are, they're, they're awesome. I, I love these guys. Um, I, I couldn't have chosen, if I was given the opportunity to choose, I couldn't have chosen better guys for my daughters. But um, I really didn't know them before they got married, hardly at all. And um, they got married, and instantly we're all quarantining together. Yep. And so I've gotten this opportunity to to spend a lot of time with them because they're, uh, you know, one of my daughters, they – it was their plan already that they were going to live in this little uh, casita that we have. So they were here already. But then my other daughter that just got married, her college was, her cancel, her classes were canceled, as were the classes for her husband. And so they're, they're living with us now too. So everybody's uh, all together and it's awesome. There are no fights? There haven't been any. <laughs> there haven't been any. Um, you guys don't have enough Italian. Not enough Italian. No. Just, um, well, I will, maybe I should amend that a little bit. My, not with my sons-in-law. No fights with my sons-in-law. But my son 
we've been playing a lot of basketball. Um, and I hadn't played basketball much in years, but that my sons in law are really good basketball players. So we go out and play just in the, you know, at our house. And my my fourteen year old son, this is the first time he's really started playing basketball, and he likes it. And he likes to compete. And I I got a ball tied up with him. You know, I, I kind of reached in and grabbed this ball from him, and I was trying to jerk it away. And I thought it was pretty clear that it's a jump ball. I mean, I've got this thing tied up. But he did not back down and just keeps thrashing around like a madman and actually broke my thumb. And so I know, I don't know that I would really consider <laughs> that a fight, but I was pissed. Yeah, well... <laughs> some point in time you got to realize they're going to get bigger than us oh stronger than us no doubt about it yeah so no going back and what there's a lot of suffering out there and if for the first few weeks all i did was watch tv and the news and and i i'm a high anxiety type person that just increased it so once i stepped away and started looking for the good things during this time i mean you could easily curl up in a ball and worry about your future but this has really taught me take it day by day do the best you can the bs the bullshit that we used to think was important is not important How, you know you're dealing with defense attorneys i've actually seen a few of them now on the streets walking in stores or whatever and i actually miss them they're good people stop you know you know the the BS fights we were getting in really were BS. It's helped me realize that stuff's not important. You know, what is important is be able to have your son break your thumb playing basketball because <laughs> you have the opportunity to do it. Not sitting at your desk. I love working from home now. I get just as much done at home, but I also have the ability if my son or my daughter wants to go do something, I'll go do it with them. So I don't know how all this is going to play out. I think there are going to be a lot of changes. Um, and hopefully I take the attitude of do what's important. No need to have the BS fights when it may ever, may never come to fruition. It's not worth the energy you spend today worrying about it, if that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. And there's a scripture that, um, that goes along with that. It's blessed are the flexible, for they shall not get bent out of shape. Are you sure? I, I have been better over the past few years but I was the inflexible full of piss and vinegar you know everything was a problem everything was a big deal I try try and I really was trying to get better over the past few years but hopefully this past three months is what puts me over the edge because honestly who cares what the other side thinks do what's right if you have to fight about it fight about it move on it's not worth the stress and the headaches and hopefully Hopefully the mindset of the, the bar gets a little better. You're going to have to be flexible in this next few years. I just read there's a new report that came out by the Supreme Court today about guidelines for, for handling the juries. I haven't read it yet, but how are you going to get a jury to show up, let alone for a criminal case in the next few months, have a suitable uh, voir dire panel? How are you going to do that? Mm. Um uh, and the criminal cases are going to have to take priority. When are the civil cases going to start up? Well, I've got one scheduled for October. You think it's going? I got one set scheduled for September. Um, I haven't heard anything about it, but I can't imagine it goes. Dang it! I really want mine to go. I, well, and, and that's to me that's the only that that's the major impetus for every party to sit there and get real is that we're going to go in front of a jury and they're going to make a decision. I just don't know how it's going to happen. Um, mm. Because we're still too early in this process. I mean, you see the, the cases of the virus go back up. That causes a lot of people to be scared. You and I are now in the same office uh, together today. That wouldn't have happened a month ago. We're going to go back into the way we were uh, a month ago because now things have opened up. we got to start closing things back down. I don't know, but what I do know, it's not worth spending a tremendous amount of emotional energy worried about what may happen in two months from now. Because I'm going to concentrate on what's important today. I'm going to do what I can today to make two months, if it happens in two months, go smoothly. But I have no control of that. Yeah. Well, that is um, a challenge. 
if you don't know if your case is going to go or not, you still have to get ready for it to go. You got to get those experts scheduled, and, uh, prepped, know, paid. And that, that that goes back to just, you know, something I was taught since day one is you, you, the minute you accept the case, you start preparing it for trial. Yeah. You never prepare a case to settle. You prepare a case for trial. So they're all ready. They're all being worked up. Um, well, let me ask you this, Scott. Um, I, I have often thought to myself, I need to do this. Um, but the reality is it, it gets pushed back until closer to trial. But I've often thought I should begin this case by writing my closing argument. Do you actually do that? I do. I formally do it. No, but um, I, I am. I I have a process where I can't turn my mind off ever. So I'm always thinking about things. I'm always making arguments in my mind when I'm driving. I'm actually, it's it's nerdy, but I will give a closing argument in a case while I'm driving in my car, and if I like it. I will actually record it. So it's there in pretty much every case I have. I'll have notes that if I'm sitting watching something uh, and can't record it, I will type myself notes. And then by the time I am at trial, I will have a, a um, folder of arguments I've already made in this case. Um, do I write the formal closing argument? No, because I don't, really don't know what it's going to be until you give it. Um, it's true. You, you don't really know what it's going to be until all of the evidence has come in. But the, th- yeah. And, but the themes, the arguments, the, 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 the analogies, you know, that needs to be thought of. If you think you're going to do that the night before you give a closing argument, you're, 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 you're done. Um, but a lot, I have, I've gone through a change in my philosophy of, of what we do. If you choose the if you choose the right case, okay, and you have a goal in order to prove your case, it doesn't matter what anybody else does because by the time I filed my case, I've pretty much done ninety percent of the work because I know I could go try that case tomorrow. I've thought about it enough. I've gotten the evidence I need to prove that case. The rest is filling in the holes. So I don't spend much time after I file a case, redeveloping theories or, or arguments, I refine. The, the, the litigation process to me is refining what I already know is a winner. Um, and I think you have to do that. I spend the vast majority of my time and efforts pre-litigation. Litigation is for the defense to try to knock down my walls and then to you know, hopefully I can go find some additional ammunition to, to use during trial. But I have not taken an expert deposition in nine years now. I don't do expert depositions. And people think I'm playing a game and, you know, they think it's in vogue now. But I say I've been doing it for nine years. I just, it's not a game. I just don't find it worth the expense. Yeah. If, you, if, if you were a mandatory disclosure state, if you don't want to disclose your, your expert's opinions, fine, I'll deal with them. My dad used to have a fit saying, how the hell did you just settle that case? You didn't take any depositions. How did, why did they pay you? Why did you get that result? And I said, Dad, because it's obvious where this case is going. I've already done the work. Whether I take their expert deposition or not, they're going to know what their expert would have said. There's nothing their expert can say. I spent a tremendous amount of time prior to the case, thinking of the theories, the themes, the evidence I need to prove the case. I get it. I file the case. And the most important thing you can do is take a heck of a deposition of the tortfeasor, whether it be a doctor, a driver, the company, whatever. If you pin them into certain testimony, I don't care what an expert says. I don't care what a defense lawyer tries to do. They've said it. They can't get out of it. They proved what I've already spent time establishing. The rest of it is, okay, what's it worth? Yeah, amen to that. Let me add a couple other things to what you said about expert uh, opposing expert depositions. Um, not only does it not 
really benefit you all that much to do it, you know, and it's costly to do it. Um, so you have to weigh the costs and the benefits. I think in a lot of ways it harms you because it, it gives them a dress rehearsal. It gives them an opportunity to identify uh, maybe inadequacies in their disclosures that they can then try to cure afterwards. Um, and maybe the judge will let them, maybe he won't or she won't, but I a hundred percent agree. I love, I love being told you're playing a game by not deposing my expert by thinking that they're, that, that you're going to pull the non-disclosure game out at trial, Scott. And my simple response is you really sound like you haven't disclosed something you want this guy to say. And if that's true, that ain't my fault. It, what is it that you're worried that that I didn't follow up on in a deposition that you need to be able to defend your case? If there's something like that out there, then you violated the disclosure rules. There is nothing that's preventing a defense lawyer from taking their own expert's deposition and disclosing that deposition as the expert's disclosure if they're worried that I should have done something by taking a deposition to get that information out. Okay? I'm not playing games. I honestly believe when you give me a disclosure, that is the opinions. You know, I'm not going to go in front of a judge and say, um, when you and nitpick and try to say, you, sh you, you didn't give me, you only gave me four of those five words of a sentence in the disclosure say no where is where was that disclosed where is that topic disclosed where is that issue disclosed where is that information disclosed if it's in there then i'm not going to fight about nitpicky things but i if if you're telling me i need to take a deposition to get your guys proper disclosure then your disclosure is improper and hold me to the same standard you know when, yeah. I, when I give an expert disclosure, I intend it to be, that's what we're going to say at trial. And you can hold me to it. Um, but I've actually had people offer to pay me to go take their expert's deposition. Really? By the hour. And again, it's like, if you really think I need to be paid to go do this, you haven't done a proper disclosure. It's not a game. I just, I, 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 I just... And my dad, I, I, he tried a case that he didn't take any depositions, in, expert depositions, for the first time. I asked him, did it make any difference? And he admitted, no, it didn't make any difference. All I did was save a lot of time and money in preparing the case. Um, and if, you, if you're going to take a deposition of an expert, or if you're going to take a deposition of a witness, I, f I hate long depositions. Mm. I mean, I, I, I've... Then you wouldn't like my depositions. Seriously? I take a long deposition. Oh, oh I've... I think my, I, mean, I love the five minute, ten minute deposition. I mean, I, I, if there, if there's something that can be done in five minutes, ten minutes, I'll, I'll do it. I, 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 I don't like. It. Okay, well, I, I don't. I, what I, about I, the evasive witness, though? I mean, how do you handle your evasive witness in a five minute deposition? No, because you can't do a five minute deposition with them. But, but what I've learned is evasive witnesses a lot of times are doing themselves more harm than good. I used to sit there, if I wanted a witness to say, you know, you were speeding, weren't you? Well, the police have them down at 65 and at 20 or whatever. You would admit that at the time of this, you were speeding. Well, what does that mean? Define speeding. You were driving over the speed limit. Can you remind me again what the speed limit was? You know what? I used to sit there and want to come across the table and strangle these witnesses. Mm, okay, I'm still okay. there. I, okay. Enlighten me. <laughs> okay. But now I've learned that is awesome because what you've just done, as the jury is going to hate that witness. If they said you were speeding, yes, that witness just took accountability. I was speeding. And you did cause this injury. Yes, I don't like those type of witnesses. But if you have a witness who obviously – was doing something wrong and can't even admit that they did the, the obvious. The jury's going to hate that person. You're going to make more points by simply saying, ma'am, you, you need me to define for you what speeding is? So I don't get angry anymore. I get happy. Well, so, okay, yes. I, I am with you there. So, so, I, so. I, do, I, I do light up when I see that because I, 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 I can see um, 
how I can use that. And I want to draw them further and further into that, which they'll, they'll do. I mean, once they've started in that path, they will just keep on going. Right. And, and, and so the, the, the younger me used to think there was only one way to win the game. And that was through just brute force and, and you're going to answer my question, damn it. And I'm going to stay here all day until you do. Well, I've realized that's not the only way to win. You can win by them not answering your question. Not answering the question can sometimes even better be better than answering the question. Sure, you're going to have to go after some people who don't answer a certain question a certain way because you need it answered a certain way. But otherwise, I've just I've learned to be more flexible. Mm. You know, um, again, I've spent a lot of time throughout this uh, uh, pandemic. There has been an incredible explosion of webinars, free legal seminars, webinars of people, great people in our, our Brian Panish, uh, Keith Mitnick, uh, Crowley. Uh, all these guys have been hours a day of free content to watch and listen to them do opening statements, depositions, closing arguments. And I, I get a lot from watching how other people are more nimble, that you don't need how you think things should turn out and should be answered and should be done. That's the way you think. But there's multiple ways to have the same outcome if you listen and you have you, you take what a witness says, and just because it wasn't what you thought they would say, if you're nimble enough and smart enough, you really, and you know where you need to get, if you don't go through door A, go through door B. Uh, if they, if they, if they want to fight you, turn them into being an obstinate witness. Um, so I, I've, I've learned a lot from watching other people be flexible. Yeah, that's a great point. You, being prepared is one thing, and we, you absolutely need to be prepared. Um, but being prepared doesn't mean having a script. Being right. script-bound really uh, takes away a lot of your uh, options, a lot of your power. I, and, and I have a feeling on that. I go into a deposition with every single question typed out. Oh, wow. Okay. Every single question typed out in exactly the language I want that question answered. Okay? Because I know that if not, not every question I have uh, to ask a certain way, okay, I can't control how the answer is going to happen. Because I know that if I ask all of those questions and whatever responses I get, I've covered every topic I need to cover in order to establish the what I need to um, to successfully prosecute the case that I know is Odie a winner. Yeah, that's how um, my dad does it. He writes out all of his questions. But it's a it's a it's it, it, it could be a tremendous detriment to anybody who does that and uses that as a as a um, as a crutch, you can't stick by your script. You have to listen to what they're telling you, because what I'll do is I will I'll have the pen in my hand and I'll ask the question, okay. And if they go on a tangent, I make a mark on that piece of paper on my questions list. Then I go to my yellow pad. And now we're on a tangent. So now I know where to go back to my script after we get back off this tangent that you just tried to take me on. Okay? Because a lot of people, if you don't, I'm too afraid if I don't have my questions scripted out, um, I'm going to forget to ask them. So uh, we can go on as many tangents as you want. I'll cover them, but I'm going back here. I'm going to get my answers, questions out. So um, you, I, I, I script my questions, but I listen. And I follow up. And preparation, if you prepare enough, you know when they're going on a tangent. You know when they're trying to take you uh, on a, a rabbit trail. Um, and you can follow those as long as you want. 
But a lot of times, if you answer, if you don't answer my question here, um, and you want to go on a tangent, I'll ignore where you're going because it, it really doesn't help my case or whatever. You can give me whatever BS excuse you want for speeding. It doesn't change the fact that you were speeding. And if you want to give me a five minute answer to you were speeding, that's fine. I used to at my dad's old firm, uh, Frank Powers and Sean Cunningham, uh, have one, have one of the greatest nurse practitioners in the world and, uh, uh, nurse paralegals in the world. She could take a better deposition than I could have for the first 10, 15 years of my practice because she's been through so many of them. And she, in preparation for every deposition the lawyer is going to take, writes out 10, 20 pages of questions and issues and, um, you know, has the question, the reason you ask this question is because it, it goes to this medical article and this medical article says A, B, or C. And you've got now 15 pages of perfect question. Wow, that's awesome. Well, is or, it? Or is it? Is it? <laughs> and here's the lesson that I was taught, is that Frank and Sean said, you are not allowed to look at that document until you've prepared the deposition yourself. Mm. Her questions and her preparation, if you're doing it properly, Scott, will already be in your outline. And you use her preparation to make sure you're prepared and you can then use it to augment your preparation. If you did miss something great, you guys have worked collaboratively, but don't sit there. You're never going to learn how to take a deposition. You're never going to learn how to the medicine. You're never going to learn um, how to process one of these cases. If you use somebody else's work product to prepare you to go in and uh, ask the questions. So uh, I, to this day, prepare all of my own questions, do all of my own research, and then at that point in time, I'll ask others for their input. Otherwise, you're going to half-ass your effort. Mm, that's a good approach. I like that. Scott, it has been a real pleasure to have you here. There's a bunch of other stuff that I'd love to get to, but I, I think that's going to have to be part two of your podcast. Let's let's do it. So right, I appreciate right. you having me here. and yeah. uh, yeah, You're a hell of a friend, hell of a guy, and I really do appreciate you having me. Amen, brother. Same, same to you. Hell of a friend, hell of a guy. And um, I appreciate you allowing me to just call you Scott during this, um, during this podcast. Normally, you insist that I call you President Palumbo, I, right? I, I do, okay. especially during this 13th month. Yep. Um, but as soon as I hit the stop button here, I'll go back to the formality that you normally demand. Thanks, President Palumbo. Thank you. That is it for this episode of Clough's Notes on Arizona Lawyer Life. Thank you to my guests and listeners. Be sure to share this show with all your lawyer friends. And if you have an idea for the show, give me a call or send me an email at brig at cloughinjurylawyers.com. I'll see you soon.